you can write it out and you can stick it in there. We read all of the ones you put in. It'd be great for us to share as well um, with you what's been going on. So, thank you. Are we done? Sorry? Nothing. Did you hear what I said? Yes. Okay. I don't think anyone else did, but fine. It was something. Well, is, is, is there anything else we... Nothing we had to say? Oh. Well, that was very quick. Um, well, we may as well worship Jesus then. Hey, hey, hey. hey. Why don't... Um, this is our worship leader this evening. Come, come forward. I, I, hold on, hold on. Hold on. I haven't warned you about this. I just came to me now as a moment of inspiration. Why don't you reenact that night in the chalet just after you came back from a honeymoon when I was listening to the glass through the wall? Go on, go on, just, just do it. It's not going to make you go look on, very hey, good. Hey, 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 just, 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 just go on, Andy. Uh, I don't think we're going to do that. No, why don't we stand to worship the Lord? No. Let's stand together now. I think, I think you've acted it out well enough for everybody already today. No, 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 no. Yes, it, you have. Live, I mean, like, these guys did a mine on the first night. You could do a little. Yes. Yes. Go, 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 no, go. No, 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 no. No, 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 you can, you can. Go on, you can, you can. You can. Shh, 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 shh. Hey, hey, hey. They're alone in their room. When you preach, you get so passionate. I can't believe we're humiliating ourselves live on God's ear. I was up for it. <laughs> Beth, I love you. I love the way you play guitar and you lead worship. You're so amazing. That's your turn. He said that with such passion and conviction. I'm amazed they're still married. Anyway, <laughs> it's a joke, huh? Why don't, why don't, why don't you, why don't, hey, 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 don't get violent. <laughs> now that's not nice, is it? It's not nice, little Crofty. Hey, hey, hey. I can't call you little Crofty anymore because there's a little, little Crofty. <laughs> hey. There's a little, little Crofty. Why don't, why don't you. We're not going to reenact that part of the night, though. Um, <laughs> No, we're not going to reenact that part. Not that I would be involved in reenacting it anyway. I, but you're not going to. No. We're on God TV. What are you doing, you idiot? Right. Um, so we worship. Why, why, yeah, why don't you pray? Okay. And maybe confess a few sins. And then we might worship Jesus All with right, a clear I'll conscience. Pray. Why don't you shut up? <laughs> Lord Jesus. All right. <laughs> The way we introduce worship at Soul Survivor is probably the worst way anyone could ever do it. Um, Lord, we just uh, we pray that you would come, that you would fill this place with your presence tonight. We ask that as we celebrate you, Jesus, uh, that you would lift your name high and that we'd meet you tonight. Amen. Cause you are the way, the truth and the life We live by faith and not by sight For you, we're living all for you Jesus, you are the way, the truth and the life We live by faith and not by sight For you, we're living all for you He's the way Thank you. 
from the grave I've been raised When I needed a savior to save me Jesus, you made a way Truth! <laughs> 
Jesus. 
as we continue just for a while to worship. You may not be used to this, but I just think it'd be great maybe just to lift up our voices um, and worship with our own words. Either speak out your praise or sing it out. You may want to just sing or speak Jesus, the name of Jesus or Emmanuel. You may want to sing in another language. Uh, however you want to do that, let's do that together. And let's just let raise our voices uh, as an offering. Bring him your own worship. Bring him your own worship. Tell him why you love him. Let's speak it and sing it. Let's speak it and sing it. That's it. Lift your voice. Don't worry about anyone else. Just tell him. You may want to sing it. You may want to speak it. In English or in another language. Let it rise to heaven. That's it. Let it rise up in a whole new way now. Let's just lift our voices louder. Just sing it or speak it. Just tell him. Tell him. Some of you, you're singing it in another language for the first time. Don't be afraid. Let it rise up like incense to heaven. The angels are joining in. Or we're joining in with them.
Stay standing for a moment, just before we go on, for a moment, for a moment, worship him in the silence. Just in your heart, tell him why you love him. And now, before we finish, let's just for a moment uh, just forget we're British, most of us. And let's just, without the music, without anything, let's just, let's just praise him by just going a little bit crazy. And with our hands, with our feet, with, with our voices, with everything we've got. Let's go. Jesus, Jesus, we love you. We love you so much. You're worthy of our praise. And we join the 10,000 times 10,000 angels, the four living creatures, the 24 old guys, and everything else uh, in the sky and in the sea and on the earth by telling you, Lord Jesus, you are magnificent. You are fantastic and we love you. Amen. 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 And the four living creatures said amen, and so did the fifth one, and everybody sat down. Wonderful. Well, um, we're going to worship the Lord some more a bit later as we wait on him and see what it is that he wants to do. Um, Jeremy, um, and... Uh, but what we want to do now is, I'm, in a moment, I'm going to introduce two very, very dear friends of mine, and I'm going to interview them as the talk. Um, I love South Africa, and I've been going to South Africa for 20 years, over 20 years, and 
and it's an amazing country, but it's also a country that's known a great deal of pain. It's a country that's known a great deal of suffering, and it's a country that's known a great deal of injustice, and it is still suffering in many ways from the effects of that. And uh, um, some years ago, um, when I went to South Africa, um, uh, I, I, um, I was a friend of mine uh, said to me, I want to take you to uh, a township which was actually a squatter camp called Ama Oti. And when I was there, it was, there was horrendous poverty. There was horrendous, I think there was hundreds of thousands of people living there. And I think it was something like 70% um, uh, HIV positive. Very few people had a job. And, and literally, it, it would be boiling hot and absolutely humid. And folk lived in mud huts or with corrugated iron roofs. And, and everywhere you walked, you saw funerals. And uh, there I met this lady um, called, uh, called Joan Smith. And then I met her husband, Titch, and we became friends. And they started going there, and God broke their heart uh, for what they saw. And uh, Titch and Joan, you're about to meet them, but they are, they are um, I'll say it, they're in their 60s, and uh, they were coasting to a very nice retirement. Uh, they, they, they'd had a lot of things uh, that went right in the last years of their lives. They had a beautiful home by the sea, uh, just north of Durban at Mshlanga Rocks, and, and so many beautiful things that they could look forward to. And uh, basically, to cut a long story short, they, they've given that all up. And uh, they've started, uh, they bought a piece of land, and they're going to tell us the story. And uh, they have built uh, a village for AIDS orphans. And uh, it's an amazing place. I've been there a number of times, and I go there every year. It's the most beautiful place. And there are now a whole bunch of children who would be orphans, who would have nothing, who were in really bad way, that live there, that have a home, that have a family. And it's beautiful the way it's set up. And in fact, um, uh, I think hopefully uh, some of the children at Live Village are watching us right now. So hello to you. I'm looking forward to seeing you guys um, uh, in April. Um, but uh, I just want to, before I introduce uh, Titch and Joan, we want to show you a little video that they made, which explains quite a bit of the background before I start asking Titch and Joan some questions. So let's look at the screen. There is a place in Durban, South Africa, in the heart of the KwaZulu-Natal Kingdom. It's a place where, as the sun rises, you hear the laughter of children. It's a place of faith, hope, justice, and love. It's a place where our lives are being changed. It is our home. Live Village. started with one man's vision. In 1997, God gave Tick Smith, founder of Love, a picture of an African village on a hill. There were clusters of homes surrounded by children running and laughing. Mothers were sitting and interacting with one another. God said to build a village for children like me, to have a safe home, food to eat, a mother to love them, a school to educate them, and where they will come to know God as their father in heaven and to create jobs for the rural communities so that they can look after their families. The government will come and see why it works, and we can point them to the cross. In this country, we have a massive problem with the orphan and vulnerable children. But at LIV, we're focusing on the solution. We believe that if we put children into a home with a mother that loves them, we believe that the restoration of the family with Jesus Christ in the center is the solution to the problems in this country. I believe that if church, business and government continue to work together, that we'll put a roof over every child's head, we'll give them a mother that will love them, we will feed and educate them to the glory of God, and this nation will be changed forever. Before starting the village, Teach Smith, who we call Baba Smith, and his wife Joan, who we call Coco Smith, fed and looked after children in the 
Amawati Township for eight years. Amawati is one of the largest informal settlements in South Africa. They did many wonderful things, like a back-to-school program for 600 children a teenage, empowerment project, teaching life skills, supporting 27 crutches, assisting and counseling families in crisis, and employed 16 previously unemployed members of the community. In April 2010, Baba and Coco Smith hosted a big banquet dinner for 4,000 guests at the Durban International Convention Center to share this vision of the village. Everyone got on board from government to business to churches. They bought 83 acres of farmland and the building of the village began. This first village will have 150 homes for 150 trained foster mothers and 1,000 kids like me. We also have a school from crash to metric with top academic and sports facilities, an early childhood development center, medical clinic, and a business development center. On the 9th of August 2011, the first mom and children moved on to the village. Everyone celebrated as the first families moved into their new homes. Because we're now in their new home, their story will begin. I have been rescued. I am being restored. I am being raised up. And I am going to be released as a star. From then, new brothers and sisters and mothers came to join our love family all the time. But not only does our love family grow on the love village, but also in the world. Many people have come to see this dream become reality. Many people have become love ambassadors, creating awareness for children like me. Wearing their love wristband with pride. Raising funds. Running. Swimming, playing sports, going on adventures, or volunteering at the village. We also see the community around us as part of our extended family. At Love, we have everything we need, so it's important for us to support our neighbors who don't. It's so much fun to give food and love to those that need it the most. Baba Smith also knew that the village has to be self-sustainable and eco-friendly to work for future generations. Love Business was birthed to invest in businesses to provide for their sustainability as well as to create jobs. Love Business is a 100% broad-based black-owned company with us, the children of Live Village, benefiting 100%. We already have many partners. But this is just the beginning. The future plan is to see many villages across our land, raising future leaders and turning scars into stars by providing a fresh start in a supportive community. There are over five million vulnerable children in our nation and thousands are added to this number daily. South Africa needs many, many villages across the country in order to turn our biggest problem into the solution. Imagine 10,000 villagers, each raising and impacting 500 orphans. Five million children rescued, restored and raised to become future leaders, impacting the continent of Africa and in turn reaching out to other orphans. Five million, each touching 10 orphans. Just imagine that. Together we can do it. a village to raise a child but we need your help partner with us and help change lives one child at a time together we can www.live-village.com
There you go. And as you probably gathered, that was all the voices there, uh, apart from Titch and Joan, the children um, who live on the village. And I'd just like you to give a welcome to Titch and Joan Smith. <laughs> all right. It's great to have you with us. And um, uh, I just want to really ask you just a few questions, and then we're going to... We're actually going to pray. Uh, first of all, it was great to ask you both. Uh, just step, take a step forward, so that's it. So, um, uh, I'd just like to ask you uh, both a little bit about your own personal stories, uh, because you both have a story. Joan, do you want to go first? Tell us a little bit about yourself. Thank you, Mike, and thank you. It's such a privilege to be here and to see all you young people. Wow, God's going to change the world through all of you. Um, just my background, um, I've got uh, two children, and uh, between us we've got seven grandchildren and one on the way. Um, my story, to, to be brief, in 1990, um, my husband went missing and um, we found his body had been murdered um, for his vehicle, and at that point I thought my life was over. I said to God, I made a deal with God. As soon as my kids, who were 13 and 17 at the time, as soon as they were grown up, I, was, I wanted him to take me home to heaven. I didn't want to be here on, on this earth anymore. It was too painful. And I said, I definitely didn't want to love again. And uh, you know what they say, beware the insurance salesman. Well, Titch was helping me with my insurances. And he was very cute. And the next thing, we fell in love, and within a year we were married. So, but he actually took me for tea, and he said God told him to look after me and my children, and I told him he was mad because I'd already made a deal with God that I was going home. But of course, kids never, you, you're always looking after your children, even when they're 40 years old. And so that's how we, we met and, and got married. And we always knew that God had a plan for us. Yeah. yeah. And Titch, um, you, you had quite a life before you met Joan. Tell us a little bit about your life, your backstory. Uh, is your microphone? No. Um, I just want to say hi to everybody and especially to our children back home if they are are watching. I do want to say, Mike, that we don't have orphan children back on the village. Our children have come to know Jesus as Lord, and they know Father in heaven that loves them. So they're part of this family, and we just say thank you, Jesus, for that. But I was, I was brought up in Johannesburg, a, a, a privileged South African who had a good education, blessed with a little bit of sporting talent, and I chased fame and fortune in the world. And at the age of 36, after I'd finished playing sport, I ended up in a home for alcoholics and drug addicts. But just before I went into the home, the night before, Peter Pollock, who had played for our country as well, he led me to Jesus. I knew that I needed something. I didn't know what I need, needed, but... He led me to the Lord, the most profound and significant time of my life. And he, he came into my life and started to change my life, Mike. Uh, you, you just said that very, very quickly. I, I just want to just, because uh, I know you, I just want to add a few bits you might be interested in. What Titch didn't say, at least not very clearly, is um, uh, he played, he was wicketkeeper for South Africa for a whole while. So you were actually an international sportsman, and you played in England for a season for Middlesex with uh, the old England captain Mike Brearley and various others. And then it all went, it all went wrong, basically, and you got into drinking, uh, drug addiction, as you said, and you ended up in this home just before you gave your life to Jesus. Then tell us what happened from then for you. As Jesus restored my life, um, I... I felt two things. One, that um, we need to live by the whole word of God. Secondly, I found out that his value system was diametrically opposed to the world's value system. 
And, and as he restored my life, I'd been on a, a retreat, and I was coming back um, in the car by myself. I cried out to God for two hours in tongues, and I said, speak to me, Lord. What do you want from my life? I said, surely there's got to be more to life than this. And then I listened for six hours, Mike, and he said to so clearly build a village for orphan children, that they would come to know me as their father, create jobs for rural communities that they can sustain their families, and that the government will come and see why it works and we can point them to the cross. And so it was a ludicrous vision. We had never worked in the community, never been into the communities in our lives, but that's where it all started. Right. And then, um, after you got married, um, you, <coughs> you lived a very comfortable life. You built up a business that was successful. You paid off debts that you'd accrued when you were drinking and taking stuff and all of that. And you had a lovely home. I think it was a six-bedroom home overlooking the ocean, about to, about to enter retirement in a very, very gracious way. And then... Joan, you ended up in Amaoti village, and that's where we met. Tell us a bit about how you got there. Well, Tichet, in 1997, as he said, when, when God gave him this vision for a, a children's village, we'd actually not even been into a poor community in, in our province, and uh, we were running a guest house in our home, and two of the ladies working for us kept talking about these starving children in Amawati. I'd never heard of Amawati, but it was only 15 minutes away from our home. And so I, I started, it started to, to niggle me, and I, I thought, maybe there's something I can do. And so I got together a group of ladies from our church, and we started making peanut butter sandwiches. And I thought, well, I'll take these sandwiches in once a week, and we used to feed these children, started with 20, 30 children under a tree in the township, and it was once a week. And I didn't have a vision beyond once a week peanut butter sandwiches. But you know, Mike, when you, when you, when you take that step and you start to go, you can't stop. And one day went to three days because these kids were starving. And then we could see that some of them needed to go to school, and that we started the back-to-school program, and that ended up with 600 kids. And so I was going in every day. And it was during that period of time, in 2004, that I saw this, this white man. He looked Greek, but he sounded English in the middle of this township. And I th thought, what is this man doing? And yeah, that's... You, know, you saw... You saw uh, 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 an olive-colored, handsome man is what you wanted to say, isn't Actually, it? Actually, yeah, you, 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 you might have been olive here, but you were very blotchy and red because the sun was so hot and it was very humid. Thank you for sharing that, Joan. And uh, we, we met there, and do you remember we went for a walk all the way around and we just seemed to gather children who were walking well, along. you were like the Pied Piper. But I think it was you. They'd not seen anything like it before. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that could go either way. Um, <laughs> and the following year, you, when you came back, you had blonde hair and very slim. Yeah, okay, let's move on very rapidly. I, I, I experimented with bleached hair for a few months. It didn't really work. Uh, but... Uh, back to you, and um, uh, you were going in there, and after a while, you started telling Titch about it, and uh, how, how did Titch arrive? Uh, well, he thought maybe he'd better go and see what his wife's doing in the township. So one very hot summer's day, in his smart insurance salesman suit, he came to visit, and we had a creche, which is like a preschool, a kindergarten, and these kids were grabbing his legs and all, and he picked one up and all the snot got onto his suit. And he handed this child back to me and he said, oh, this is not for me. He said, I'll go and make the money and you can feed the kids. And uh, something then happened to change that, Titch. Tell us the next part of the story. Uh, I think you and, and Hugh Evans wanted to go and film on a Saturday morning, so Joni asked me to go with her. We went to the community, and it's not a good time to go on weekends. 
the men drink a lot, drug a lot. And, and out of this shabin, out of this tavern came this young girl with blood all over her. And uh, they had tried to rape her in this shabin, 40 drunk men, and then they tried to cut off her hand with an ax. And as we walked into this place, um, we started to share and talk to them. And, and some got angrier and angrier, and others started to listen. And I felt God say to me that they're as vulnerable to the gospel as they are to the things of the world, but nobody's offering them the gospel. And I felt God say, I need to start to go in. And so I started going in with Joni and, and started to share the love of Jesus with those that were unemployed, Mike. I just need to add one thing there. At the time, I didn't realize that this was one of the first time Titch had ever been into Amorti. And we were walking up this hill, and it happened so quick. I didn't have time to be scared at the beginning, but literally, it was awful. This young lady was running past screaming, and I saw blood coming, and then I saw her hand severed. And I said, did I see that right? Did I see that right? And then you led us into the place, into the drinking place, where she'd come out of and was preaching the gospel. And I thought, I must be safe. This guy clearly knows what he's doing. If I had known then, I'd have run for my life. Uh, but, but actually, that was the beginning of God breaking your heart, wasn't it? Yeah, Mark. He, he, once you see that poverty, um, he does break your heart for the things that break his. It's very difficult not to, to start to do what, what he's called you to do. Yeah. And then uh, tell us that between you the next part of the story, how you went from there to starting a village. Yeah. Yeah, I, I joined Joan and then we, 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 we started to work in the communities. We planted a church and then in 2007 we had a crusade. We had a 5,000 seat tent and we preached the gospel for, for 28 nights and thousands came to know Jesus. And um, one of the, the speakers was a, a guy back home and he gave me a book called Passing the Baton. And as I read this book, I felt God say to give our business to our youngest son. We've got four children between us. Joni had two and I had two, um, and to give the business to him and join Joan full-time in the community. So that's what I did. I, I gave the business to our younger son, went into the community full-time. And then in 2008, I felt God say, clear your desk and spend time with me, which I ignored. I said, Lord, well, I've given you my life. What more do you want? I'm in the community. And then he asked me, he said, do you love me enough to stop? And I said, stop what, Lord? He said, stop everything. And, and that was a bit of a shock to us because I just joined Joan, and we went away, and we started to pray. On the 9th of January, 2009, Mike, as I start to document, as I spend time with my father, he said, the time for the village is now. It was 12 years after he gave me the vision, and he said the time for the vision was, the time for the village was now. So our, our lives had changed. We had paid back the debt, and we were able to buy a farm. And so that's where it happened, where it started. So that's where it started. And then what happened? How did, you then, uh, how did you then come to the place that you are now? Well, I, I remember saying to Titch that day we stood on, on that land for the first time on this broken down chicken farm. And I said to him, don't ever ask me to move from our house on the beach, which was my dream house, and come and live on the farm, which would have been my worst nightmare. So as we bought the farm, I felt God say that he'll bring the money and the expertise. We had no money, Mike, after buying the farm. It was a broken down chicken shed. I found 100 people to give me 1,000 rands each a month, and that enabled us to do the town planning and the, and the environmental application forms. And then I felt God say we needed to bring business and government together, have a banquet, and we'd raise the money in a night. So we had this incredible banquet at our international convention center, we invited 4,000 people, business and government, and we shared the vision, and we started to raise the money to build the village. So, banquet, big meal for 4,000 people. 4,000 people. And um, um, had you catered for 4,000 before? I don't cook. <laughs> so when he said to me, we're gonna have a banquet for 4,000 people, I thought, well, the only way we can do that is if Jesus supplies the food. Yeah, like at least done, done that, hasn't he? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was an incredible thing because joni has been an incredible support to me. We didn't have the money, Mike. It cost £100,000, the banquet, uh, 1.7 million rands. And I asked her if, because it was so clear that God said bring business and government together. So we took a mortgage on our house to pay for the banquet. So she's and been... he hadn't sold one table yet, and that was his job. <laughs> but he's an amazingly faithful God, and... and, and, and 
as we took that step in faith, he started to, to bring in the money, Mike. And then you had the banquet. You had all sorts of people from government and business there. And <coughs> various folks spoke at it. The money started coming in. And then having bought the farm, you've turned it into what we see now. Tell us where things are at now. What do we have? And what's the vision for the future? Um, Mike, Mike, we bought the farm next door. So we have 450 acres now. We're hoping to build a couple of villages with two to 3,000 children. We have built uh, 96 homes. The church has just been completed, a 2,000-seated church. Um, we have a clinic and, and occupational therapy rooms. We have the early childhood development center, and the first 25 classrooms have been built. Um, and the children come in through the courts. So we, we moved to the village. Mike, I must tell you, after Joni asked me not to, the guy leading the village left, and, and um, we started to pray for somebody to come and lead the church and the village. And I don't know if it happens to you, but I pray. And often God, when we pray, he's speaking to us. So I said to Joni, I felt God say, we need to move to the village. And she said, no, that's fine with her. She'll pack my bags and she'll come and visit me on weekends. <laughs> did you really say that? I did, yes. <laughs> yes. And then um, that's not quite how it worked out, is it? No. How, how did things change there? Well, well actually, um, I, I kind of knew inside um, that, that God was asking us because God don't, never tells he, he, you know you just know in your knower and I did argue with him for a while and I, I made him wait a few weeks and then I read a book called Love Has a Face by Michelle Perry and she's the lady from America with one hip, one leg and one kidney and God sent her to southern Sudan to start an orphanage there so I closed the book and I said to Titch better I come to, to Virulam before God sends me to southern Sudan. So you ended so up... moved. So you moved, and I've been to your home in, in, the, in the village. It's a very modest home. Um, and, uh, and how do you feel about the move? Well, I think if Titch said to me now, this was in December 2012, if he said to me now, we can go back to the beach house, I'd say I'd help him pack and I'll visit him on weekends because it's the most beautiful beautiful thing we kind of doing life together with these kids and the mothers and other staff members and and it's just such a privilege to be there we love them with every ounce of our beings and they come into our home our home is open to them um, we we teach them about family life i'm called gogo which means granny in Zulu, Titch is called Baba, which means father, and it's not because he looks younger than me, just need to clear that, um, but it's because they have got mothers in the homes. Yeah. Each, home, each mother gets six children yeah. in a home. Now, I know that you, you can't, we can't really talk about individual children uh, for obvious reasons, but can you just give, can, not examples, but can, just, can you just say, where those children come from and what is happening to them now some examples of of what god has done in their lives and how it all works yeah we, we we've had an incredible thing we, we can do nothing uh, god continues to tell us to bring these children to his feet and then we even have to get out the way and allow the holy spirit to transform these these children and make them whole and uh, it's been an incredible privilege they love jesus um with all of their hearts they're passionate about jesus and um, we've had children, seven, eight, nine years old, laying hands on our headmaster who had a, a knee that they had to operate, and, and he got healed. Um, we've had others that couldn't read or write, and they've now read from Genesis to Revelation. Our first child from the community has just graduated at university. She wrote 34 subjects over three years and got 24 distinctions. She's qualified as a journalist. So, So it's just a privilege, Mike, to, to be a small part of what God is doing in our nation. Um, I believe that if, if the church and business continue to work together, we'll put over a roof over every child's head. We'll give them a mother that loves them. We'll feed and educate them to the glory of God. Our nation will be changed forever, and the world will know who our God is, because nobody can do it but Jesus. Last. Right. Last couple of questions. First of all, 
Has it been easy? <laughs> we, we, we've got a young couple with us uh, from, from the village. He's from Liverpool and, and, and he supports Manchester United. But <laughs> no, he's, he's passionate about Liverpool. He's passionate about Liverpool. But a, a young Afrikaans girl won his heart and they're married now. And Mike, it's been tough. It's, it's really, it's been no greater privilege. People ask what life is like living in a poverty-stricken community. We've never had more problems. We've never been busier, but there's no place that we'd rather be. Um, yeah, it's been an incredible privilege to see life through the, the eyes of the poverty-stricken. Uh, and Jesus just loves them. He's got, he loves them. Yeah. And you've also, you now also work in um, the community Cottonlands, which is just outside, which again is also, there's some extreme poverty and unemployment and AIDS. And uh, um, you employ people from that community and you've started businesses and the profits from the businesses go to the village and it gives employment to folk. That is also quite amazing. You've done all these things. You've, you've met with top business people, even the, um, the prime minister of, um, who's come and who's said. And just tell us very quickly, Titch, about the response of the, the government in, in KwaZulu-Natal. Yeah, I, I had the privilege of going to, to cabinet to share the vision. And this is what the Minister of Health said, our Minister of Health. He said, ladies and gentlemen, I've just got back from Rwanda. I saw with my own eyes babies feeding off the breasts of dead mothers. He said, we're fast going down that road in this country if we don't do something about it. He said, how can we as the government, after what we've seen and heard this morning, stand in the way of God's vision for the children of this nation? He said, I support this 100%. And the whole government has supported us. Isn't that amazing? And, and last question. You've done all this. You're responsible for all these children now, for these business, for everything. Uh, what qualifications do you have for this? Mark, I, I have no qualifications. I went to university. I didn't get anything. Um, I end up in a home for alcoholics and drug addicts. And I just, I went to speak at a school, uh, like Eton or Harrow, um, after we built the village, at this Founders Day. And I was standing in, in the lounge with the headmaster, and a board member came to me and said to me, a young man, what qualifies you to speak here at this function? And I was a bit taken aback, and I said, no, sir, nothing qualifies me. Nothing qualifies me. But as I walked down to the hall for this function, I said to God, what am I doing here? What qualifies me to be here? And he said, nothing qualifies you. You're a broken down, drunken sportsman. But he said, the only thing that qualifies is you is that you're passionately in love with me and I've broken your heart for the destitute, the widow, the, pet, the, the orphan, and, and the poor of our nation. And so we stand here as a couple with no qualifications, but passionately in love with Jesus and with a broken heart for the widow, the author, orphan, the destitute, and the poor, Mike. That's the only qualifications we have, is a broken heart and a, passionate for, a passion for Jesus. And, Say and Titch often says, you know, we don't know what we're doing, and it's actually true, we don't know what we're doing. But I say to him, when you're asking people for millions, you mustn't tell them you don't know what you're doing because, you know, but the only thing that we knew was to love these children. So when the first children started to come onto the village, we just expressed that love of Jesus and hugged them and told them and how wonderful they are and that God has a plan for their lives and then we watched the miracle of transformation which God and it's the love of Christ that you give that's the miracle that's what happens when 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 you love on people and their lives are transformed and so it's true love never fails wonderful but Mike I just want to put you on the spot again. We're going to bring the choir next year to come to the Soul Survivor Vestal so they can meet their family.
Guys, thank you. If you just go stand there for a moment. Um, guys, what Titch just said there is we've, we've had this dream of bringing some of those children over next year with Titch and Joan and for them to be part of this and to be a children's choir, to be involved in the worship. Um, I want Titch to stand there because I find it hard to say some of this with them standing next to me. Uh, the reason I wanted to interview them is for more than one. First of all, you heard their story. Joan's, jo Joan's first husband was murdered, and as a result, she just wanted to die. As soon as her kids were grown up, she said, I don't want to be here. Titch ended up in a home, a uh, rehabilitation home, as he said, for alcoholics and drug addicts. Nothing qualifies them except, as they said, please hear this, they love Jesus and they give their all for him. And they've gone for it. They've been available. They've said yes to him. They've attempted to be obedient. And a miracle is happening. I go there every year and I see it. I've seen it develop. And honestly, every time we, we turn the corner and we drive in, I, I just, I just want to cry. And, uh, and you see these kids that come from broken places who have a family now, who, have, who know they belong. And for Titch and Joan, you know, um, the, the house they're living in now, it's, it's, it's a very modest home in the middle of this village. Uh, and there's no air conditioning because the other houses don't have air conditioning. And in Durban in the summer, that, believe me, is very, very, very hot. And they're there, and I've never seen, I've never seen a couple so contented, so full of joy. Yes, there's many tears, but there is much, much joy. God wants to use you like he uses them. God wants to use you. We, can ha we have a choice. We can either exist in security or live in adventure. Let's choose to live in adventure. Let's say enough of consumer Christianity. Let's say enough of Christianity that's just about me and for me and that's simply about my needs. Yes, Jesus wants to meet us. Jesus wants to heal us. Jesus wants to set us free. Jesus wants to bless us. But so that we can be a blessing to a broken and hurting world, so that we can go in Jesus' name and do what Jesus does and join in with his ministry. And with Titch and Joan and Live Village, <clears throat> you can get involved if you like. First of all, by praying, we've supported and them. We love that we are able to bring this to you. So we want to make sure that you're tuning in. Remember, you can catch up and find more updates on God.tv forward slash Soul Survivor. Make sure that you're emailing us and following us on Facebook and Twitter. Use the hashtag Soul Survivor 15. We want to make sure that you're connecting with us and we want to make sure that we're hearing everything that you have to say. I mean, Mike this morning was talking about the Father's heart and he was talking and he was giving out words of knowledge at the end. And honestly, we haven't shown that kind of stuff before from Soul Survivor. We don't always, saw, we don't always show ministry on air. Um, and so we're blessed to be able to bring that to you today and actually show you a little bit more of what goes on here. And we want to continue doing that every year at Soul Survivor to expand. We have an exciting new project coming up, which we're doing the pilots for this year, which you guys will see later on air, called Soul Survivor Nights, which is where in the evenings they have late night worship and all all the young people gather together and just worship the Lord around the campfire and then also within one of the buildings they have over there and we're excited to bring you also um, there's a lot more that goes on than just in the big tent there's a lot of sermons and sessions that happen where people talk about things that may be a little bit more edgy so we've also got people giving stand-up talks straight to camera straight to you guys at home just about the harder hitting subjects whether that's homosexuality abortion depression suicide, whatever the Lord is putting on their hearts to talk about, which sometimes people find uncomfortable. Um, and us being on television enables us to go into living rooms and to environments and computers and phones around the world, mobile devices, where we have an in that not everybody gets. So we're able to evangelize as well as equip the church. And that's our heart. We want to see one billion people saved around the world. We want to see one billion souls saved and reached and the lost wherever they are. And media is a wonderful tool for us to be able to do that. So we're gonna go ahead and go back to the meeting in a little bit, but we just wanted to make sure that you guys knew what was going on. 
to inform you about how you can catch up on things coming up later and also tell you a little bit and explain what's going on. We actually interviewed Titch earlier and his wife Joan, so you'll be seeing that later on our Soul Survivor episodes. And it was so wonderful to hear the heart that they carry, to hear what the Lord is saying to them. It's powerful. And we love partnering with people wherever they are. We love partnering with the heart of God. And we're seeing that again and again. You saw with Mission Possible earlier and then Awakening Europe. The Lord is doing something around the world and he's moving with passion. He's moving and we're seeing him change the atmosphere. We're seeing him change things and environments. And it's amazing to see what he's doing and to witness. And it's amazing that we're able to carry it to your homes around the world. It's a privilege. And thank you for partnering with us here at God TV. Thank you for enabling us to bring this into your homes. Thank you for standing with us for so many years. This is our 20th year broadcasting. It's amazing. So we are so privileged to do what we do. But right now, let's go back in and to the main stage with Mike. That Titch and Joan started, and, every, and they employ folk that were unemployed, and any penny of profit goes to Live Village and goes to giving to those who have nothing. So I just wanted to mention that. And not, not only that, not only would you be uh, in helping a ministry, but also you would look flipping good. All right, so I wanted to say that. Let's, uh, let's stand together. Let's stand. That is size of, oh gosh, that feels better. And uh, Beth and the band, why don't you come and just be here? And Andy and Ali and Titch and Joan, maybe just come and be, be around. Okay, guys, we're going to pray. We're going to pray. Um, I'm not sure how to do this, so we're going to do it this way. I think that there are some of you even before tonight, you sensed God calling you to overseas mission. And uh, there's a bit of me that's hesitant about saying, sending anyone overseas, because we need every missionary we can in the United Kingdom. But actually, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And, it, and, the, and Jesus said, give and it will be given to you. And as we go, in the past, this has been a missionary nation. As we go to proclaim the gospel in word and deed, he will bless our nation for sure. He will, he will bring others here to proclaim. So some of you, you, you just, you've known, you've known that God is calling you to mission overseas at some stage in your life. Some of you, you even know the country, you even know the place. If you know that's you, uh, we want to pray for you first. And then we're going to pray for a whole bunch of others. Could you come forward if you really, really know that? Don't come forward if you don't. Um, we want to pray for, for this because we're going to pray for others of you later. For those of you, you know that. Oh, my word. Okay. Okay. Don't stand too close to each other. Uh, just take a little step. That's okay because we want to be able to pray for you. And for most of you, you're just like me. Okay, you can stay up the aisles. Guys, I know you've been sitting a long time. With those of you that are standing, could you just for a moment, just for a few moments, just sit down, others of you, so we can see. Just for a few moments, sit down. All right. Okay. Right. If you've come forward, we're going to pray for you first. And then we're going to pray for a whole load of others. Um, okay. Could those who are able to pray. Now, guys, we need everyone to pray for everyone. I haven't got time to do a whole. We might do this more. Basically, all you do, the only qualification you need now at Soul Survivor to pray for people is to love Jesus and breathe oxygen. It's very simple. Don't kill it with words. Put a hand in an appropriate place. And just pray, Lord, bless this person. 
fill them with your spirit. Give them all that they need. And then don't kill it with words. Please don't preach at them. Please don't give them advice. It's about Jesus. So what you do is you just lay hand and look at them while you're praying so you can see what the Lord's doing. You will start to see the Holy Spirit resting on them. If you have been to Soul Survivor before, we really need you to go now to anywhere where there's people. There's people all the way, wow, all the way up the back, all the way around. Uh, just, just go find them. And we're going to pray. We need folk at the front. We need lots all over and the sides. Just come right through and be ready. Okay. Are you ready? Come and find a victim. Some of you come right through to the front. Guys, and then we're going to pray. Let's the rest of us be still. Let's the rest of us be still. Okay, you might want to put him down. Oh, that's great. Okay. Um, okay, now the Holy Spirit, we haven't even started, and the Holy Spirit's resting on people already. All right? Now, those of you that are being prayed for, you don't need to try and do anything. You don't need to struggle. You don't need to strive. You don't need to try to make anything happen. All you have to do is be still and receive. Be still and know that I am God. We will do the praying. Okay? Guys, let's just be still. Let's pray. And now, Father, in the name of Jesus, we ask that you send your Holy Spirit. We thank you for these lives that are willing uh, to give their all to you, to obey you. For these that are wanting to move out of their comfort zone. And Lord Jesus, we pray that you would speak to them, maybe more details in the months and years to come. But right now, we pray that you would anoint them, that you would break their hearts with the things that break your heart. That, Lord, that, that they that sow in tears will truly reap in joy. We pray that there would be right now, even a sowing in tears, we ask, Lord, that you would empower them, empower them to live for you, empower them to, uh, to love for you. Put your love in their hearts. Put your love in their hearts, Lord Jesus. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. More of you. Now, let's just wait a second. The Holy Spirit's just beginning to move among us, and he's just going to start doing stuff. All right? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Just wait. I want to take a moment to encourage you at home to join in with what's going on. I mean, we believe that on, when people are watching at home, they can join in and be impacted just as much. Exactly. Just remember that story I told you yesterday about my sister. You know, she was back home in her, in her, in her bedroom, and um, she was saying, Lord, if you can do it there, you can do it right here with me. And I just want to encourage you just to say that prayer. If you want to, if you want to make that commitment now, if you think this, this is all about what your heart's breaking for, then I just encourage you just to make that prayer in your room, wherever you are, uh, maybe in your living room with your parents or you're up, up in your bedroom by yourself, just on Facebook. Just, just take a little moment out and say that prayer. And you can do that. If he does more altar calls throughout the evening, make sure that you're joining in. Make sure you're participating. Mm. This is not a spectator sport. This is something for you to participate in. So join in with us. We're going to go back to worship and hear what Mike's saying. It's, he's, he's, breaking, um, right. he's breaking your heart with the things that break his. And that's good. And that's good. It will be all right. It will be all right. You know, compassion uh, comes uh, before healing so often. Jesus had compassion on the people, and he healed them. And uh, there, 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 there is a cost uh, in that sense. He wants us to be co-workers with him. So we don't go as robots, we go as lovers. We go as lovers. Lovers, not robots. And so, Lord, so, Lord, release your love in our hearts. Release your love in our hearts. 
Thank you, Lord. Um, I could have this wrong, but I think, I think the Lord said to me that there's someone here. You, you sense a real call from God to, to serve him abroad, uh, but you've had an illness uh, that I think the doctors or someone's told you that you'll never be able to go where you wanted to go because of, of what's happened to you because of the illness you've had. And, um, and, and actually, you can't get it out of your mind um, that, that, that God's sending you there. Um, and I think you were even thinking about it in the last couple of days. I think we're meant to pray for you and pray that the Lord Jesus heals you completely of whatever it is of the effects of that. Um, who, who is that? Who is that? You sense a call to mission overseas, but you were told that you had an illness that where? Is that, is that you? All right, sweet. Um, is, if, if, a couple of, if you could pray for her, and it could, is there a member of the enabling team or one of our teams who could come? Is there a lady who could come over there? Lovely. Beth, you go there. That's it. We're going to pray. Lord Jesus, we pray healing now of whatever it is. Healing, Lord. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done in this life as it is in heaven. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I think let's just wait a moment. Now, what's very interesting is the more we wait, the more he does. Okay? You just see, the more we wait, the more people are, I can see here, the Spirit of God's resting on folk more and more. We just wait for him. We just wait. It's like, it's like marinating in his presence. Thank you, Lord. Okay, I know we prayed about this this morning. Some, not the same thing, but something similar. And the reason I'm hesitating is I don't quite know why we're meant to... But I think the Lord's saying we're meant to do this. That there are some of you here, and again, I, it may be that he just wants to do more. Or, you really, really want to give your whole life to him. You really, really want to serve him. You really, really want to go for it. But you, you just feel condemned. And you just feel like, I can't do it. I've messed up. I've been messed up. And even though we've talked about it in the first two meetings... Um, that, that's not, and, but just hearing Titch and Joan's story about where they've come from and how God is using them, it's almost like, could, could that be possible? And you just feel like, I just don't know that God, how could God use me? I'm not, maybe I'm, you don't feel very, very intelligent or articulate or, or maybe you're very broken. Maybe you're, you're into stuff that you're addicted to and you don't know how to get out of it, but you just feel constantly condemned. I believe Jesus wants to break the power of that and he wants to anoint you in your brokenness to change the world. If you know that's you and you're sitting down, why don't you stand up wherever you are right now? Just stand up right now. Those of you that are, it's described you. That's it. That's it. Now I want those around to get ready to pray for these folk that are standing. All right? And please, please do that. You don't have to be an expert at it. You just have to love. You just have to love. Why don't we gather around those who are standing? 
and let's just pray for them. And Lord Jesus, um, all over this tent, we break the power of condemnation that comes from the enemy and not from you. For there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has triumphed over the law of sin and death. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And Lord Jesus, you've always used broken people. You've always used failures. You've always used people who have messed up because it's all about your grace. It's all about your grace. We don't deserve it, we never will. But Lord Jesus, these young men and women, they're saying they're available. Come by your spirit. Holy Spirit, would you now just set them free? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Could you just make sure everyone's being prayed for who's standing? Please, just if there is, just, just go to them. All right. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Okay. I think there's someone here. In a moment, we're going to begin just quietly to worship the Lord. Uh, and you know what? If I think Jesus is speaking to me, I'd rather say it and be wrong than always wonder. Because if I say it and I'm wrong, nobody dies. Or well, they haven't died yet. Um, but, but if I say it and it is the Lord, someone gets blessed. And I, I don't mind looking foolish. And I don't mind being a fake because I spent a lot of my life feeling a failure. So I'm used to it. But I think there's someone here, between six and a half and seven years ago, um, uh, something was said to you. You were told something that you didn't know about your life that devastated you. Someone told you something. It was six and a half to seven years ago. And it's like you keep thinking about it. It's like your identity. And it's like it's confused you. And uh, again, I think... I think you were thinking about it in the last 24 hours. Um, we're not going to ask you for details. We just want to pray for you. Who, who is that? If that's, is that you? Is that you? All right. Can you try and come forward? Just, um, that's it. Okay. Okay. Why don't we just begin to worship the Lord Jesus? Why don't we begin to worship the Lord Jesus? And um, just come and, if you can come here, Andy's just going to have a quick chat and a pray with you. And maybe one of the team. All right. All right. Let's look to Jesus. Those of you that are sitting, when you want to stand, feel free to stand. Well, there's going to be more prayer, but we're just going to hang out with him for a little bit, yeah? As God does business with us all over this tent. All right. Let's worship. This is my desire. It's to honor you. Lord, with all my
is crazy but we just want to keep looking to Jesus let's worship him the Lord's doing wonderful things and he wants to change us he wants to heal us that we might go out in his name that we might be a people that join in God's mission This is a hard one to respond to. I think the Lord's saying that there's more than one person here. Um, you, your, your father is a church leader, is a pastor, um, but he's been, um, he's been quite violent or he's been beating you or he's been treating you really badly. And it's really churned you up. It's really affecting you really, really badly. Jesus wants to heal you and set you free. Now, I'm not going to ask you to respond so that I can see, and I'm going to ask the, the cameras not to go here, but Graham, could you just turn around? And uh, uh, Graham Cray here, just put your hand up, Graham. Graham is here. If you know that's you, could you come to him? Um, he's, um, no, we just want to pray for you. We just want to pray for you. No one's going to ask you any questions you don't want, but this is really important. There are some of you, that's what's been going on with you. And Jesus wants to meet with you. And he wants to set you free. And Graham will get people to pray for you, not to ask questions. But if you're in that position, uh, your father is a pastor, a church leader. And you've been really badly mistreated. And, and I think for a couple of you, it's been, it's been physical. Uh, you know, physical beatings. Um, the Lord wants to meet with you. Now, no cameras are going to be on you, and no one's going to say anything more, but we just want to pray for you. Please, it's important that you come and you get it dealt with. Let's continue to worship the Lord together and look to heaven.
I know it's time to say to go, but I think, can we just wait a second? I think, I, th- I think just, I could be completely wrong. I think there's another move of the spirit just coming. Let's just wait a second. And if I've got it wrong, we just go to the venues a bit earlier. Lord Jesus, whatever you want to do, whatever you want to do. Don't worry about what's just beginning to happen. It's okay. Okay, there's just a... And this is very different to what was happening earlier. Is it all God? No, some of it's us, but a lot of it is from God. And a lot of it's our response to God. Lord, just release now. Release healing through joy. Release it, Lord. Release it, Lord. Release it. The joy of the Lord is your strength. In his presence there is joy evermore. 
Don't be afraid. Now, if you're not, if you're not laughing, neither am I. If you're not feeling anything, okay, some are a lot now. Uh, neither am I. Andy, are you feeling anything? No, Andy never feels anything, so we're fine. You don't feel left out. We're just going to wait. This is just, a, 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 for some, it's a refreshing time. There's another wave coming of his presence. Now don't be afraid, it's only laughter. Okay. Now those of you, those of you that you're, you know the Spirit of God is resting on you, and, and, and for many of you it's joy, but for some of you it's other things, could you just come forward? And could those who are at the front who are not being prayed for, prayed for maybe just step back? Just come forward. I know some of you are going to find it hard to come forward because you're almost overcome. And some of you are at the back. But I think there's something that God wants to do with, with lots of you. Just come forward now. And Lord Jesus, I pray, even as they come forward, would you release more of your anointing? Lord, would you release uh, healing? You know, laughter and tears are very similar psychologically. All right? So what it is is... It's like they, they, they're both, uh, 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 there's a healing that comes. That's it, just come. And Lord Jesus, even as they come, would you release, Lord, your presence in a whole new way. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Just come from everywhere. Just come. I mean, don't barge through, but just gently come through. That's it. That's it. That's it. And others, just pause a second. Just pause a second. We're just going to pray. And then we're going to begin to worship. And then in a, in a little while, obviously, if those of you that want to go, go. But the, the, the venues aren't even open just yet. And Lord Jesus, even as they come forward now, would you release the fullness of what's begun? Release it, Lord. Thank you. Release it, Lord. More. More of your presence. More of your presence. More, more of joy in your presence. More healing in your presence. Lord, would you, would they become, would they be overcome by you? Thank you, Lord. And for some of you, it's not even that. It's almost like you don't know what to do with yourself. You want to run around and shout or whatever it is. It's like an overwhelming joy. It, it's the fruit of being filled with the Spirit. And Lord Jesus, do this all over this place. Others of you guys, let's just for a moment halt any conversations because something uh, is just about to break in a new way. We need folk to come and pray for these folk here. Just come and pray for these folk, both sides and over here. Just come and pray. Thank you, Lord. 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 Increase your anointing now, Lord Jesus. Increase your anointing. Let it come. It's okay. Don't be afraid of what's happening. For some of you, this has never happened before. That's it. It's Jesus. It's more of Jesus. More of Jesus. More of Jesus. We need others to come and pray here. Just come and pray for these guys. Thank you. Thank you. Now we're gonna we're gonna just worship for a little longer. Um, when you want to go, feel free to go. If you could go quietly, all right? Please, let's, can we have the conversation outside so that we can keep this a place of prayer and worship and focused on Jesus? Lord Jesus, thank you for what you're doing. We ask for more right now. We ask for more of you.